Uh, good evening. May I have your attention, please? Uh, welcome. Uh, it's wonderful that such a uh, lively crowd has come to Holy Trinity Church tonight. My name is uh, Father Kevin Gillespie, and indeed it's a privilege to welcome you and to hear uh, sort of an historical occasion. I should mention that you, as citizens, I understand the purpose of the Citizens Association of Georgetown is to evolve and flourish by ensuring the integrity of its historical legacy and overall vitality. I don't know who wrote that, Neville, but it's, it's engaging um, because evolving and flourishing, that's what we here at Holy Trinity wish to do. You may know that the seats, this building where you are sitting in, was a hospital in the Civil War. Brave men died here. Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln came here for a funeral, as well as continuing. We've had President Kennedy and Jacqueline Kennedy worshiped here. John Jr. was baptized here. I also say, by the way, Katie Ledecky, the great swimmer. I saw her the other night at Christmas. And I said, Katie, every time you win a gold medal, I brag that we gave you your first swim. So it is indeed an honor for you to be uh, for, uh, for us to welcome you and to hear. I like to think of a historical method as looking backward, forward, and the three talks tonight do that. So without further ado, let us pray in this sacred space. Blessed are you, Lord God of mercy, who gave us a marvelous example in the witness of so many in life and our history of our nation in the history of Georgetown, and the great commandment of love for one another may continue to be embodied by these citizens and throughout Georgetown. Send down your blessings on these, our friends, who so generously devote themselves to helping others. When they are called on in times of need, let them faithfully serve you and their neighbor, and may this organization continue to evolve and flourish for your greater glory. Amen. Welcome all and enjoy uh, the talks, and I bring forth Neville. Good evening and welcome. My name is Tara Secreta Parker, and I'm the president of the Citizens Association of Georgetown. We are so thrilled to see all of you here tonight. Um, this is the third Black History Month program uh, since my presidency, and the other two have been virtual, online. So it really is such a treat to have all of us gathered here today. I want to thank you so much. President Gerald Ford officially recognized Black History Month in 1976 to, quote, honor the too often neglected accomplishments of African Americans in every endeavor throughout history. Every president since President Ford has made the identical proclamation. February has been the chosen month because it coincides with the birthdays of both Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass, both of whom incidentally walked the streets of Georgetown and attended a funeral in this very place. Tonight we learn about the history of Afri African Americans in this neighborhood Surrounded by two slave states and once allowing slavery itself, this community has a rich African-American history encompassing the slavery days, then the historic era of Jim Crow and segregation, and culminating in the civil rights movement and current struggles. As we will hear tonight, Georgetown was and is in the middle of that rich history which I know you will find fascinating, troubling, and uplifting, all three. For the third year in a row, it is my honor to introduce Mr. Neville Waters III, my neighbor and my dear friend. A sixth generation Washingtonian, Mr. Neville Waters, has his grandfather bought the home on P Street in the 1920s when it was predominantly a black neighborhood. It has remained in the family ever since, once holding all three generations 
of Neville Waters under one roof. It's been quite a scene. <laughs> From playing sports in Rose Park throughout childhood to his teen years, grabbing burgers at Little Tavern, delicious, and attending the Sidwell Friends School to a dream fulfilled, earning his MBA at Georgetown University. His memories of Georgetown are vivid and immense. He is currently the president of the foundation that supports the Mount Zion Female Union Band Society Cemetery, where he and his team work to restore, maintain, and extend the legacy of the cemetery and the contributions of Black people in Georgetown. Neville, thank you so much for again being with us this year. We're so lucky. Thank you, Tara, very much. I appreciate those kind words. I have to tell you, when all generations of Neville lived under the same roof, if you called out Neville, nobody answered. We, so you had to distinguish us by Mr. Waters, who was my grandfather, uh, Big Neville, who was my father, and Little Neville. Uh, and to this day, when people come up and say, ooh, Little Neville, I know that they have some history with me. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, before I begin, I, I wanted to show, I, I wore something particular tonight. Uh, it, it, it basically says, uh, I am my ancestors' wildest dreams. Um, and I think that in many ways, for particularly black people, when our ancestors were working towards either freedom or a better life, um, they envisioned that um, their families, their histories would uh, build upon their foundation. And, and I feel very proud of the fact that I have, uh, in my base generations, uh, individuals who were enslaved, freed in 1862 as six-year-olds. My, my great-great-grandfather and his twin um, were freed at the age of six. Um, now, he was born in 1856, Charles Turner, and the fact that he lived 82 years. I can't even imagine what the life expectancy was generally for a black man born into slavery in 1856. I'm sure 82 is not the, the norm. So I feel pretty good about my genetic makeup. Uh, I'm shooting for 100. Uh, before I, I introduce uh, the, the folks this evening to talk about um, African-American contributions here, um, I do want to put in one plug for uh, the cemetery work that we've been doing. We've just launched a uh, cemetery's information system uh, on, the, on our website. You can go there, block, blackgeorgetown.com or blackgeorgetown.org. So it should be pretty easy to find. Um, and on this in, uh, information system now, there are death records, biographical information, documents, portraits of over 4,000 individuals who have been interred at the cemeteries. Um, there's uh, burial details. Uh, and we really want to acknowledge the contributions of the Mount Zion Church, um, Georgetown and DC funeral homes, the DC Health Department, uh, newspapers, uh, input from educators, researchers, and other descendants. It's a fabulous, fabulous uh, resource. You can put in a name and you can pull up all this information. So, Please check it out on the blackgeorgetown.com or blackgeorgetown.org website, the cemetery's information system. So anyway, uh, this evening, there is uh, a, a couple of, of special guests we have here this evening. Uh, one is uh, Mr. Rex Carnegie, who's the director of education for the Georgetown Heritage, which is an organization dedicated to revitalizing the national parks in Georgetown, and Rex in particular has worked in educational programs for a decade, creating and implementing programs for the U.S. Capitol, the White House, Library of Congress, uh, National Park Service, the Smithsonian, including the Museum of African American History and Culture. Uh, he's designed the canal boat tours, and I don't know if anyone had a chance to take them last spring, but it's pretty fascinating. Um, I remember as a little kid when the, the mule used to carry that, but that's a whole other story. Um, he serves as an interpreter of the canal history, and his presentation is going to focus on the canal story over the years through the lens of African Americans 
uh, uh, highlighting the contributions and experiences and, and providing a, a richer picture of the canal. Um, and then the other more personal connection is some of the history here with Holy Trinity. I've been very impressed with the efforts of uh, that there, uh, I, I have to give a shout out to Ashley, uh, Ashley Click, who has organized this group. Um, three years ago, uh, uh, Peter Albert, Bernie Cook, and Paul Mako, who created their history team to explore race and racism at Holy Trinity. And uh, frankly, the, the, the history there is, is not necessarily a positive one, but they were willing to, uh, when you say face a racial reckoning, and, and while we can't change history, we can certainly learn from it. Um, so uh, all three of them have been very active in the social justice ministry here at Holy Trinity, and they've uh, produced 22 articles on free and enslaved black parishioners, uh, and they're gonna highlight some of the work that they've done in their research. And I know in particular, they have in the past had uh, my grandmother's narrative of uh, uh, leaving this church because of the, the segregation and going to uh, help found uh, Epiphany a few blocks away from here. So um, I really uh, appreciate the work that they've done and, and they've it, you know, embraced me as uh, a wayward child coming home, so to speak. Um, and then hopefully uh, we're gonna have a performance to wrap things up this evening uh, from uh, the Voices of Zion, which was a production that was done last year that highlighted some of the stories of those who are buried at the Mount Zion Female Union Band Cemetery. Um, and uh, the young man who's the music director at the Mount Zion Church will uh, lead a, a, a few songs uh, to end our, our program this evening. So um, I would like to have uh, our guests come up uh, and I didn't know if Ashley was going to be the one or not. Good evening. And thank you, Neville, Tara, and the Citizens Association of Georgetown for including us in this evening's program. Holy Trinity was established in 1787. That was not an isolated event, but incident to a larger one. Trinity, as it was then called, was born in the shadow and of the substance of Georgetown College. Both enterprises were the work of a small group of priests, former and soon to be again Jesuits. That small group, 19 of the 21 Catholic priests then in the United States, resided in Maryland on several manners, from which they ministered to Catholics and proselytized the indigenous people in the greater region. Those manners grew tobacco and financially supported the efforts of the priests. Initially, their workers were indentured servants, servants whose labor repaid the cost of their voyage from England. Indentured servants were soon replaced by enslaved black people who, by 1790, numbered 323. So our history, Trinity's history, is entwined with enslavement. The first history of Trinity did not mention this at all. The second, William Warner's At Peace With All Their Neighbors, does to some degree and says from the outset Free and enslaved blacks constituted 30% of our congregation. However, he tells us little of the lives of our black parishioners between Trinity's early days and their exodus to Epiphany Church in the mid-1920s, and nothing thereafter. Aside from the reconciliation service with Epiphany in April 1994, our parish paid little attention to the subject of race until our 225th anniversary, when a group of our parishioners known as the 225 History Group produced a series of articles collectively called A Pilgrimage to Our Past. Among them, one on the integration of our grade school in 1953, Memories of Black Georgetown, 
conversation with Adele Dotson, Holy Trinity School's first black student, for which Ms. Dotson graciously shared her experiences. Two years later, in the summer of George Floyd, our restorative justice group proposed several projects on racial healing, including the study of slavery, segregation, and race in our parish. Ashley Click, our pastoral assistant for social justice, agreed and founded a history. Several members of the 225 history group joined in, including Bernard Clark. Other parishioners soon joined, among them Peter Alba. You will hear from both shortly. Our first articles by Peter and Bernie were posted in November 2020. Among the acknowledgments made by Peter is his thanks to Dorothy Harris Gray, Linda Gray, and April Lynn Bowler of Epiphany Church for their generous assistance in the research for documentation. Others, Neville among them, have likewise been generous in sharing family records and memorabilia critical to our work. You may find those articles, 22 to date, on our website, holytrinity.org, Trin uh, by clicking on About and then Holy Trinity History. So why are we doing this? Our purpose is to provide a source of education to our parishioners and others about the role of slavery, segregation, and race in Holy Trinity's history. We hope that in throwing light on our parish's past, our work will open doors to reflection on that past, as well as on its implications for and better understanding of our present and inspire our daily interactions with each other. Our efforts are being put to good use. For example, on Good Friday, April 2nd, 2021 at Holy Rood, Father Gillespie's reading out of the names of our enslaved black parishioners buried in unmarked graves. The following year, a pilgrimage was made from Holy Rood with prayers, readings, and the naming of the enslaved and free black parishioners buried there and ending here, where pilgrims could contemplate the crowded balconies behind them, the architectural embodiment of Jim Crow, and reflect on the exodus to epiphany. More rewarding to us is the growing connection and collaboration and in research into Black Catholic family histories with members of Epiphany, St. Augustine's, and descendants of our Black former parishioners. Our monthly meeting now, our monthly meetings now greatly benefit from the participation of the Grays, Larice Redhead, Dina Grant, Sybil Templeman Williams, and Father Ray Kemp. We're most graceful, grateful for your invitation to us this evening. And I now turn you over to Bernie and Peter. While we acknowledge that Holy Trinity's priests and white parishioners were guilty of racism, we celebrate black parishioners who enriched our early parish life. Among Holy Trinity's exemplary parishioners were Lucy and Liddy Butler and Anne Marie Beecraft. Lucy and Liddy Butler and many other butlers were members of the parish from its earliest years. The Butler family had won their freedom after protracted litigation. Lucy and Liddy Butler were apparently great granddaughters of Eleanor, Irish Nell, an indentured servant who had married Charles Butler, an enslaved man, in a Catholic ceremony in 1681. Members of the Butler family petitioned the Maryland Court of Appeals for their freedom on the basis that their grandmother was a free white woman. After protracted litigation, the court granted their appeals. One historian has written that Lucy and Liddy Butler, quote, did more to bring together 
a strongly committed black Catholic community than the combined efforts of the church itself or the white laity. During the parish's first quarter century, the two sisters served as godmothers to 65 of the black children, enslaved and free, baptized in the parish. That number 65 amounted to approximately one out of three of the baptisms of black children at Holy Trinity during that time. The role of godmother was particularly important among enslaved Catholic African Americans. If a parent were separated from their children through sale, the godmother would assume the role of emotional support and guidance for the godchild. Lucy Butler died on the 25th of November in 1821 and was buried the next day on Georgetown's campus, the old burial ground for Holy Trinity. Liddy Butler, who died on January the 28th in 1834 at the age of 80, was buried at Trinity's Holy Rood Cemetery. Sixteen other butlers between the ages of six months and 86 were buried from Holy Trinity, this church, between 1834 and 1866. Only one of them was enslaved. Anne Marie Beecraft was the oldest child of William and Sarah Beecraft, free African Americans. Her grandmother reputedly was a freed woman who worked in the household of Charles Carroll of Carrollton, a signer of the Declaration of Independence and a cousin of Bishop John Carroll, the founder of Georgetown University. William Beecraft, born on Carroll's estate, lived in Georgetown and became the chief steward at Union Hotel. Anne Beecraft's mother, Sarah, who died at the age of 70 in 1866, was buried at Holy Rood. In 1824, when Anne Beecraft was 15, she, with financial support from black Catholics, opened a school for female black children in Georgetown. The school was first located on Dumbarton Street, but in 1827, with the support of the Sisters of Visitation and Father John Van Lommel here at Holy Trinity, the school relocated across the street from Visitation. Anne-Marie Beecraft ran the school, which had an average of 35 boarders and day school students. Anne-Marie Beecraft was active at Holy Trinity Parish as well. She served as godmother to at least three children and sewed altar cloths and vestments for the parish. Anne Marie Beecraft, after preparing a successor, left her school in the fall of 1831 to join the Oblate Sisters of Providence, an order of African-American nuns in Baltimore. She took the name Sister Mary Aloysius in honor of the young Jesuit saint. Beecraft, who had long suffered from what was described as a chest ailment, entered the convent's infirmary in 1833, where she died in December. The oldest building on the campus of Georgetown University was renamed Beecraft Hall in 2017. It had previously been named for Father William McSherry, the Jesuit provincial who oversaw the sale of 272 enslaved people by the Jesuits to plantation owners in Southern Louisiana. We look back to Liddy and Lucy Butler and Anne-Marie Beecraft with gratitude, but also with sadness at, their, at the indignities that they and our black sisters and brothers brothers suffer at our hands.
Neville Water asked us to remember tonight some of the black parishioners who worshiped here at Holy Trinity. How many there were. Trinity was over 40% black in the 1830s. There were some 700 black parishioners here in the 1870s. So many thousand gone, the spiritual said. Let us remember them here tonight, where their memory surrounds us, a great cloud of witnesses. From 1851, when it was dedicated, down to the 1920s, when the black congregation left Holy Trinity to form Epiphany Parish, this church was a segregated space. Picture it tonight, just after the Civil War. There were 138 pews down here on the main floor for white folks. There were 42 pews upstairs for black people in two long balconies, now gone, along the side of the church and a small balcony in the back. In your imagination, climb the stairs as those parishioners had to meet some of them tonight. Let me tell you about them. Sitting in the balcony in back, I keep bumping this, sitting in the balcony in back, two rows from the back of the church, was Caroline B. Craft. The B. Crafts rented a pew at Holy Trinity for nearly 40 years. William B. Craft, Anne Marie, and Carolyn's father rented a pew in our original church as early as 1831. He had a pew here in the main church from 1851 until 1860. His daughter Caroline, a dressmaker, then rented that pew until 1868. Lucian Jones, freed in 1862 by E.T. emancipation, rented that same view from 1868 to 1871. He paid his pew rent by pumping the bellows for the church organ located back there. He was a teamster. Others emancipated in 1862 also rented pews in our segregated balconies for themselves and their families. Winnie Coates from 1853 to 1871. After emancipation, he worked as a washerwoman. Hester Solomon from 1860 to 1875. After her husband died, she could no longer afford to pay pew rent and leave pew. Ignatius Tillman rented from 1857 to 1875. Tillman and his family were enslaved up the street at Visitation Convent. His son escaped slavery there to join the Union Army. Now, Esther Solomon and her family sat in a pew just up here on my right. The Tillmans sat in a pew in front of her. Winnie Coates and her family sat next to the Tillmans. They could look down and see some of those who were or who had been their enslavers in the pew below them sitting on the main floor of the church. In the year of emancipation, their enslavers were reimbursed for emancipating them, but they themselves received no compensation for their years of servitude. Of course, from the founding of the parish, many free black Catholics worship here at Holy Trinity as well. Many sat in our balcony. Bernie has mentioned the Beecraft, Butler family. Let me tell you about another one, the Belt family. 
They were parishioners here for four generations. They lived a block from the church up 36th Street. Mary Bell rented a pew here from 1853 to 1855. Her sister-in-law, Martha, from 1864 to 1865. You can see Martha Bell's headstone and her husband's and her son at Holyrood Cemetery. Lucy Copley's large family had two pews right up here next to the Tillman. And here I want to thank Sybil Temple McWilliams of St. Augustine, who shared with me her rich grove of information on the Copley. A vendor at Georgetown Market, Lucy Copley had a pew in the original church from 1842 onward and here in the main church from 1851 to 1876. Her daughter Frances rented a pew in the 1880s and 1890s. Lucy Copley married at Trinity in 1824 and baptized at least eight children here. Four grew up to be dressmakers. Two of them fought in the Civil War. Two of them were founders of St. Augustine Church. We remember tonight the black parishioners who sat in these balconies, some of them enslaved, others free, some of them alone, others with families, some of them here for a short time, others for decades. Let us remember their names, let us remember their lives. Uh, Rex, you ready? Come on up. Hey, how's everybody doing today? Good. Um, well, thank you to Citizens Association of Georgetown and to Old Trinity for organizing this and having folks come to talk about this history. And happy Black History Month to everyone, because today is the first day. Um, thanks also for allowing me, on behalf of my organization, Georgetown Heritage, to share some of our local culture, you know, a little bit uh, more on the southerly side with you. Uh, my name is Rex. I'm the Director of Education and Partnerships for Georgetown Heritage. This past year, our organization returned the canal boat to the CNO Canal here in Georgetown. Yes, yes. For the first time in over a decade, folks could ride the boat up and down the canal and learn about its history and its heritage. Over 20,000 people from 49 states and 48 different countries bought a ticket last year, including over 5,000 folks from the DMV. And I'm happy to share with you all this evening that thanks to our partners with the National Park Service, the canal boat will be back this spring for another season of boat rides in the spring. Yes. So hey, you all will get the chance to get a ticket and take a ride on DC's premier historic boat tour, and I hope that you will take advantage of that. For more information, you can speak to me later or check out our website. Well, tonight, what I'd like to do is share some stories with you about the African Americans that made and were made by our canal. So let's go back in time almost 100 years. Can everybody read that? What does that say? 1939. In 1939, our canal, again, just a few blocks this way, was actually in disrepair. It had been closed since 1924 for about 15 years. There were several floods, the rise of a much more efficient railroad. But the government wanted to sort of transform the canal as a long stretch of, of site into a historic place for people to come. And they need workers to do that. Where are they going to find these workers from? Well, it just so happens that President Roosevelt, in this year, 1939, has a New Deal policy, a public works program called the Civilian Conservation Corps. Now, this was young men during the Great Depression who needed work and they were given jobs fighting forest fires and planting trees, and also restoring and repairing historic sites, much like our canal. 
Now two companies of the CCC, company 333 and 325 CJ, were responsible for repairing the first 22 miles of the CNO Canal, including right here in Georgetown. The C stood for colored. So these were segregated, all African American companies. And I can show you a couple of photos, I hope everybody can see. But they, obviously they cleared land, they repaired locks and culverts, they built structures that still actually stand today up in Maryland, and they even did work on the inside of what we call the prism of the canal. African American women also worked with the CCC, uh, including one in particular who was a favorite of the guys in the camps. Her name was Pansy Williams, and mostly what these women did was offer education to the young men in the camps. Some of these guys, believe it or not, even helped out with the old canal boat tours in the 40s that the National Park Service used to run, very similar to what we do today. And here's a little picture of some of that happening. You can see some folks driving the mules, and there's a member of the CCC in there. Um, there was a gentleman by the name of Frank White who was an enrollee of Camp 333, and he wrote a poem to commemorate the end of his tour of service. I'd like to share a bit of his poem with you all today, and this is a picture of it as it was typed out by him. Uh, we who are about to depart from the shore upon which we once embarked feel it is our duty to express the very feelings of our hearts. The days pass swiftly by to most of our regrets. We did our duties with a smile and hardships we've tried to forget. We have gathered a lot from our stay. We have beaten rocks and are on our weary way. In our hearts will remain the teachings of our Heavenly Father. And you will always be the same, our only alma mater. Well, those of us who enjoy the canal today really do owe a debt of gratitude to these members of the Civilian Conservation Board companies. Well, let's continue moving back in time about 60 years or so now to this. What does this say? All right. What will we be doing in 1878? And this is in the heyday of the canal, the 1870s. Um, well, mostly what we'd be doing is unloading and loading our cargo, especially coal and timber coming from the Appalachian Mountains at Cumberland, Maryland, here in Washington, D.C., or manufactured goods going from Georgetown up north, like flour or paper or whiskey, which is my favorite one. Um, I feel kind of weird saying that in church, but, you know, it's all right. Or even ice, believe it or not. Now, um, we also might need to offload into the Potomac as goods, you know, come down to ships that are bound for the Chesapeake and for the Atlantic. Um, I don't know, this is going to be difficult to see, but this is sort of a, a catacorner map of where the canal would have gone. So this is us here in Washington and Georgetown, all the way up to Cumberland, a distance of 184 and a half miles, also a change in elevation, about 605 feet, which is 50 feet more than the Washington Monument is tall. So we're talking about a very, very great distance in elevation. Now, every boat had to have a captain back in the day. What, uh, and this is the audience participation part of the program today, um, what's a good name for like an old time boat captain back in the day, what do you think? Somebody say Patrick? That might be a good one, what do you think? Come on, oh, what'd you say? Smoke, oh that's a good one, Smokey. Old Captain Smokey, anything else? What's that? Theater? Skipper, oh okay, Skipper, ah, that's a pretty good one. Well, I tell you what I'm gonna. Oh, someone got another one. Captain Jack. Captain Jack. I said you're in the 1700s. You're a little bit before us, but, but you know what? That works too. All right. I tell you what I'm gonna do. I'm actually gonna share you guys uh, with you guys some names from the actual canal boat register in 1878. So these are the names of real people who actually captain boats. Captain Mrs. Jeremiah Dick. Captain Kate Broderick. Captain Mary. E. Long, Captain Mrs. E. J. Arrington, Captain Mrs. M. Walker, Captain Mrs. McQuaid, Captain Mrs. Patterson. Are you noticing a pattern with these names? That's right, women captaining boats. Okay? Now, how about these names? Captain J. W. Johnson, Captain Lewis Robinson, Captain Wilson Middleton, and Captain Kirk Fields. Do those names sound appropriate? Well, what if I told you that those were the names of African American men 
who captained boats on this canal in the year 1878. Um, and this is something I'm very excited to share with, uh, with you all due to some of the research work of uh, my colleague, our education specialist at Georgetown Heritage. Her name is Jasmine Nash. If any of you have ever ridden on the boat, you might have seen her giving interpretive tours to, to you. She uncovered through census data that in the 1870s, there was actually an African-American man by the name of Henry Johnson, who served as a quote-unquote tender to the locks in Georgetown. So this was a lock keeper right here down the road who was African-American. We actually don't know a whole lot about Mr. Henry Johnson. And one of the things I'm hoping will come out of tonight is that some of the folks who have done some of this historical work, if you've ever come across his name or if there's any information that you might have, we would love to find out more and to be able to interpret some of his story. This, by the way, is the, uh, the census sheet that we found where his name and that of his family uh, is on here. All right, so that's what we have for 1878. You all should also know, by the way, that just a year later in 1879, um, an African-American man named Jer James Carroll was accused of assaulting a white woman in Licksville, Maryland. He had worked on the canal, and so some folks came looking for him in Georgetown. When they found him right here by the canal in Georgetown, he was arrested, put on a train, and in Point of Rocks, Maryland, that train was waylaid by a mob of folks uh, from Frederick County. They pulled him off the train and lynched him, hung him until he was dead. So certainly there was opportunity on the canal, but also still an environment of oppression and ab abject terror for so many. And this echoes many stories of black history across the country, which leads us to our next section. What year is that? All right, so in 1837, there are many people working and also traveling along the canal. Some folks coming here to Washington from Maryland, others going from Georgetown to points north. Now in the year 1837, why would anyone who was African-American want to find a way north? Yeah, you probably got it. So we do know of one person, at least one person, who partially used the canal in his escape from slavery in the year 1837, and his name was James Curry. This, uh, you can kind of see it, this is actually an ad from 1837 after he had escaped that uh, the, the person who enslaved him had taken out in a local paper, and it talks about him and his two brothers leaving the plantation and escaping from North Carolina. Now, he and his two brothers did do that, but they were separated somewhere close to Virginia when slave catchers, seeing that ad, came after them. Uh, listen to a little bit about what he said um, on his escape. At Alexandria, I crossed the Potomac River and came to Washington. I lost my course and traveled on the towpath of the canal from Friday night till Sunday morning. I soon saw a man riding toward me on horseback. As he came near, he put his eyes upon me and I felt sure he intended to question me. I fell to praying to God to protect me and so praying fervently, I went forward. When he met me, he stopped his horse, leaned forward, and looked at me, and then, without speaking, rode on again. I still fully believe it was, at first, his intention to question. I soon entered a colored person's house on the side of the canal with it, gave me breakfast, and treated me very kindly. Now, James shared his story with a Rhode Island abolitionist named Elizabeth Buffum Chase, and she published a book version of his brave escape. That's how we have so much information on him and his story. Then later he was able to make his way north into Canada and to freedom. Years later, believe it or not, James' mother, Lucy, decided, inspired by her son, that she too would escape, making her way from North Carolina up north through the states and finally reaching Canada where she was reunited in freedom with her son James. And when she heard about this, Miss Chase, that abolitionist, composed a poem in honor of Lucy and really in honor of all uh, folks who were seeking freedom from one of America's most shameful institutions. I would like to share just a bit of that poem with you all today. And thou art safe across the line, thou high-souled Carolina's daughter. Oh sure, a nobler heart than thine was never born o'er Erie's water. One child, thy eldest born, had fled where galling chains no longer bind him, and his free footsteps safely tread where keen-eyed slavery may not find him. 
reviving hopes which many a year in slavery's dark night had slumbered now whispered freedom in thine ear and her pure peaceful blessings number and thou art free no earthly power again may cast the chain around thee a tyrant master's lash no more shall go as when the fetter bound thee This is our final story for the evening. And by the way, there are so many. Trying to pick which ones to include in tonight's program was very difficult. If you're interested in hearing more, please flag me down at any moment. And again, come on our boat tour where you might be able to hear more stories like this and really representing all the diverse peoples who called the canal home, including before it was a canal or before we even ever had a Georgetown. Um, this canal was started, uh, the Zeno Canal, in 1828. Laborers, mostly immigrants from Ireland and Germany, but also free and enslaved African Americans, spent 22 years using picks, shovels, and gunpowder to dig out the inside, or what we call the prism, of the canal. President John Quincy Adams conducted the groundbreaking on Independence Day, July 4th, 1828, at Little Falls, Maryland. This event marked the first time, believe it or not, Hail to the Chief was played for a president. And he was brought up to the site by a boat upriver. Now the story goes that one boatman by the name of Plummer made a bet that his 18-year-old daughter could safely pilot the boat with the president and his guests up the Potomac. So the bet was finalized, I like to think on a handshake, and Ms. Mary Ann Plummer served to navigate the boat to the groundbreaking site for President Adams. Mary Ann Plummer was a young, free, black woman. She was the granddaughter of Captain George Pointer, who bought his own freedom in 1793 and served as the final superintendent for the Potomac Canal Company in Maryland, Virginia, which really was the precursor to our CNO Canal. Pointer and his son-in-law had taught young Mary Ann from a very young age to pilot boats, and so she was well-versed in boat operation by the time of the bet. Miss Plummer, later on in life, uh, even told her children the story of how she danced for President Adams at the groundbreaking. Can you imagine such a scene? I like to think that it was hail to the chief plane, and she decided to you know, do something, and the president was so excited. But we'll never know, you know the ins and outs of that story. Um, now, I'd like to mention that one year later in, in 1829, uh, Captain George Pointer, young Mary Ann's grandfather, actually wrote to the CNO Canal Company. As they were building it, it was sort of encroaching on his land in Maryland. And this here is actually a copy of his letter. Um, you can't really, I know, make it out. This is, you know, 1700 style writing. But I'd like to share a little excerpt of what he wrote with you all today. He said, the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal is drawing near my little college that I have occupied for 43 years, unmolested with an aged wife and some offspring. If the new company does dispossess us, give me some little place adjacent to the new canal that they may upon it support themselves for the few days that they have to breathe upon this earth. God has prospered the old canal that the father of his country, speaking of George Washington, first brought into existence and may he favor the new one. Your very humble and obedient servant, Captain George Pointer. And I'd like to think that thanks to Captain Pointer's prayer, um, you know, Providence has certainly favored what we've been able to accomplish on the canal thus far, and hopefully will be able to in the future. Again, my name is Rex, representing Georgetown Heritage. Thank you all so much for your time, and feel free again, pull, pull me to the side, drive me down, if you want more information on this history of the canal. Thanks, bye-bye. Thank you so much, uh, Rex. Uh, I want to thank, in particular, the Biz Georgetown Business Improvement District for helping to sponsor this evening tonight. We wouldn't be here without their support. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, I, I want to, and I do want to encourage you to, to take the boat ride uh, come spring. When, when, when is it going to reopen? Do you know? Yeah. April. Okay. Uh, it's, it's pretty fascinating. I think one of the things that's particularly interesting when we talk about what's called in sort of urban slavery, I know when I was learning history, I always envisioned that slaves are out picking cotton, 
um, and not that necessarily their degrees of whether it's good or bad, but it is a different animal, so to speak, uh, they're working on boats and masonry, and I think it's a very valuable, uh, insightful educational, as well as an, an enjoyable experience riding the canal. So I encourage you to, to do that. Um, anyway, we're going to uh, wrap up uh, our uh, program this evening with some music. Um, last spring, um, a play was produced called Voices of Zion. Um, it featured stories about those who were buried at the Mount Zion Female Union Band Society Cemeteries. Um, and Ronald Walton, otherwise known as Trey here, uh, put together the music for that program. And he's going to do a, a selection here along with uh, his accompanist, uh, Miss Cherie. Sherry. I like Cherie, but Sherry, you got it. Okay. Uh, so, anyway, uh, Ronald, Trey, Walton, without any further ado, the mic is yours. Okay, well, first off, uh, good night, everyone, because it's about time for me to go to bed, and so are you. Uh, this opera that was written last spring was very inspirational. Um, I couldn't do it without the help of Lisa Fager, our dear friend, who is currently right now fighting breast cancer. And tonight I dedicate this piece, How Many, written by Gerard Lee and myself, the music for it, uh, to her with Sherry Jackson singing soprano. Um, this piece is a very special piece. And if you all don't like any loud singing, I suggest you plug your ears in. Uh, Sherry has a powerful voice. And she plays the character of Mary Beckett, who was a widow who sued. Oh, help me out here now. Wait, hold up. Sherry, did she, she, what, what did she do? She sued. I can't remember the character, but. It's been so long since I've heard that story and seen it. But anyway, though, here out with the further to how many from the opera Voices of Zion.
Cherry Trey. That was amazing. Wow. We'll give him an, another round of applause. Wow. Incredible. Thank you. Thank you so much. And on behalf of the Citizens Association of Georgetown, again, thank you for being here tonight. I want to say a special thank you to Brittany Sawyer, CAG's executive director, who really was instrumental in putting this program together. Also a big thank you to Neville and Monica Roche for their never-ending support of CAG in this Black History Month program. Thank you. Also, Holy Trinity, Father Gillespie, Ashley for this beautiful space, Bernie, Peter, Paul, for your incredible work sharing these stories with us tonight. Um, it's really compelling and we just appreciate you so much. Thank you. Uh, and to the bid, the Georgetown bid. Um, thank you so much. I saw Joan Stern leave earlier to Nancy and Rex. In particular, what a compelling narrative that you gave us, a re really great visual of the canal. I'm looking forward to taking the boat trip again, um, and thank you for being here tonight. So uh, on behalf, of, again, of the Citizens Association of Georgetown, we want you, we need you to join us, become a member, join a committee, join our board. Hopefully you're receiving our communications. We want you, there's a place for you. You're here tonight. There's more wonderful work that we can do together and we want to have you. So go on to our website, visit cagtown.org, reach out to Brittany. Um, we're looking forward to hearing from you. And again, happy Black History Month. Thank you for spending the first evening of this month with us tonight. Take care, good night.